Hi everyone, Janie here. Welcome back to my garden. I wanted to get out into the garden this morning and get some work done. I just wanted to be outside and I figured I would take you all along with me. It's not very interesting what I'm doing today. It's just general gardening maintenance, deadheading and cleaning up and kind of just getting my hands on my plants to make sure that they're doing okay. We have had such a hot summer this summer. It has been incredibly, incredibly hot and unfortunately Unfortunately, my garden is less than a year old. Actually, it's just about a year old this month. And a lot of my plants have been suffering just because they're not all uh, rooted in, they're not all settled in. And so a lot of my plants have been hard, having a hard time. So just getting out here and checking on them and seeing if there's anything that I can do to help them out is exactly what I wanted to do this morning. So I got started with deadheading my banana cream to Shasta daisies. I love this plant, especially during the summer because it has these beautiful creamy yellow blooms and you can see the blooms are all over the plant. Now the one drawback to this perennial is that the blooms do fade and you do have to deadhead them to get a second flush and then deadhead again even to get a third flush depending on how long your gardening season is. So it's just important with any type of Shasta daisies to go ahead and deadhead them to make sure that they're not putting energy into setting seed and you get another round of blooms. Now you can see I am not being specific when I deadhead these Shasta daisies. I'm just getting in there and making sure that I prune off the bloom head. I, You know, you can do it one by one and be very careful and go down the stem about a quarter of the way, but I just wanna make sure that I get them deadheaded. And I have so many Shasta daisies in my garden, in this new garden, that I just need to get in there and I just need to to get it done. It's kind of the same way I feel about roses. I know I could probably get more blooms if I'm a little bit more careful, but you just got to weigh the pros and cons. Now I left this shot in because it's just too funny. Jason was taking the girls to camp and they were just leaving right then. And that's Monty just watching them leave his sad eyes watching them leave. Oh, and then he gets over it. <laughs> so I just thought it was too funny. <laughs> so back to the flowers, the banana cream to Shasta daisies from Proven Winners. They're hardy zones five through nine. They do get about 22 inches wide and two feet tall. And I have planted mine very, very close together, which I might end up having to separate them a little bit because you can see how happy they are. They do take full sun, but they do say that in some places with really, really hot summers, you might want to give them a little bit of afternoon shade, but this spot right here doesn't get any afternoon shade and I don't see any scorching at all. Right in front of the Shasta daisies, I do have my Whirlwind Blue Scavola and you all know how much I love that plant because it can be as hot as it can be and it's still going to look absolutely beautiful. And I really like this combination, the banana cream too, with the Scavola in front of it. Now moving on to the next plant that I wanted to take care of today, and that was my Pyromania Hot and Cold Red Hot Poker, otherwise known as Nyphothia. I think I've been talking about Nyphothia as much as I've been talking about the Scavola. I just think that they are such a cool, beautiful plant, a neat addition, especially when you pair it with kind of a softer plant, like the Surefire Rose just behind it. So this plant definitely needed some deadheading as well. Uh, I do have to say that this plant, when you deadhead it, it it starts blooming again almost immediately. It's really cool and I've noticed that when you deadhead it, it will send up even more blooms. So I've had a lot of people send me messages saying I only have one or two bloom stalks on my Nyphofia and the recommendation I have is just be patient, just keep deadheading and it'll keep gaining more energy and it'll keep sending up more and more blooms. So this one was the second flush of blooms that I've had this summer. I know I'll have another one and probably one more after that and there's even a lot of baby bloom stalks coming up right now. So I just think this is one plant that it's super important to deadhead because if I don't deadhead it, I'm not going to get any more blooms. So this variety of Nyphofia is called hot and cold. And it's obviously called hot and cold because it has the hot color of the orange on the tip of the bloom stalk. And then it kind of fades in an ombre effect to kind of a cool yellow. It's very, very interesting. I would say probably my favorite version of Nyphofia is the orange blaze, which is a full orange bloom head. But this one is so beautiful as well. This one is hardy it zones five through nine. It gets three feet tall and about two and a half feet wide. So mine are 
babies. They're going to get a lot bigger. And I have some other varieties of Nyphophia, the orange blaze in my garden, that are already getting pretty huge. So just be patient. Make sure you deadhead. Make sure you give it plenty of water and it'll be a beautiful plant for you in your garden. Now take a look at this pop-up bag that I'm using today. Look at these handles. This bag is actually from Hoselink. Yes, the, the hose brand that I use, the retractable hose brand, they have other gardening supplies as well, including this pop-up bag, which is actually new. And so I'm using it for the first time today and I'm actually really liking it. One, because it's tall and narrow, so it fits those long bloom stalks that I'm pr pruning off. And two, it has these great long handles, making it way easier uh, to carry around. So something to think about, I'll link it in the description down below, but it's just a new, kind of a new product product that I've been trying out today and I, I really like it. So I'm finishing up with pruning the rest of my hot and cold Nyphophia and then I'm going to move on to pruning my iceberg roses. Now again, I don't do it the right way. I just run through and go as quick as I can just to get as many old bloom heads off just to make sure that that plant has plenty of energy for another flush of blooms. There's obviously a better way to prune roses than the way I do it, but I did want to show you all this because I kind of want to give you all an excuse to be a lazy gardener. It is okay to be a lazy gardener. It's okay to not do it quote unquote the right way. Just get out there and try and understand what's right for your plants. I, it's one of the things like I was saying, just getting out there, getting your hands on the plants, really paying attention to it. You know, it don't be intimidated by doing something the right way. Just pay attention and listen to your plant. And that is the right way for you and your garden. Maybe that's just an excuse for me not doing it right, but that's okay. So here's a sad sight over here. I am so disappointed. I'm so bummed out. My Royal Raspberry Agastache, one of them, I have three of them right here. One of them is dead. One of them is doing perfectly fine and one of them is like half dead. And I came over here to try and diagnose the problem and see what was going on. You can see I'm kind of pulling apart the plant, trying to look at it and see whether it's a root problem, whether I overwatered, whether it was underwatered. I do have gophers in this area, like pretty significant gophers. And so I was wondering if there was a gopher that had gone through there, but I couldn't find any evidence of that. And honestly, I I'm not sure what happened to this Agastache. I am putting it in the in the column of what Jim Putnam calls sudden plant death season in that in the summer it's so hot and plants can either get overwatered or underwatered so easily and you don't even notice it can be fine one day and then die the next day. I think that something like that happened with this plant and when I was feeling around down here you can see me kind of looking at the soil it was definitely moist. The soil it had lots of water in the soil and I almost think maybe a little too much water. Water. Um, so we have been, like I said, we have been very, very hot here and the automatic response to, you know, weeks on end of heat waves is to turn your drip irrigation way up. Jason and I actually turned our drip irrigation on three times a day because we were worried about our plants and I think we overcorrected. I really, really do think we overcorrected. Um, and so, and I know that because I do see some areas of my, uh, my decomposed granite pathway that do have some water on it. So I know I have some runoff going on and and runoff is always a sign that you are, are probably watering too much. Uh, so I think I am going to take away that second, that middle of the day watering and go back to what I'm used to, which is uh, twice uh, twice a day, morning and night in the summertime. And then um, as it gets cooler, I just do once in the morning. Now I am definitely bummed about losing this Agastache, especially because I loved it so much and it's so beautiful, but I also don't think of it as a complete failure. It's kind of just a learning opportunity for me this whole first year in my garden. And honestly, you guys probably next year is going to be learning about this new garden, learning about the soil, learning about the lighting, learning about the water, how much watering it needs. I am just getting used to this new garden and I feel like every day I'm learning something new. So seeing this plant die, seeing this plant succumb to whatever it is, I think of it as a learning experience. I was talking to somebody who says, 
You never learn anything about a plant if it just performs perfectly all the time. You only learn something about a plant if it dies or if it struggles. And so I'm just looking this, looking at this as an opportunity to learn something about my soil, about my drip irrigation, all that kind of stuff. So as I continued on deadheading my banana cream Shasta daisies, I started thinking about these mistakes or failures that I've had in my garden. You know, looking right there at that Agastache that is suffering so much, I started thinking about how important it is actually to make these mistakes because these mistakes are what are going to set me up for future success in this garden. So these mistakes are actually so incredibly important. And as a YouTuber, as a content creator that is putting my garden out there for you all to get inspired and to learn from, I feel as though it's really important to show you all these mistakes because these are how we are all going to learn. We're going to learn what we need to do about our garden, what we need to do differently and truthfully how to read a plant and understand what a plant is trying to tell us uh, whether a plant is trying to tell us that it didn't get enough water or that it got too much water or that it was planted in the wrong place you can look at a plant and eventually you can read and see exactly what that plant is trying to tell you and the only way that you're going to learn that skill is if you make mistakes in your garden so I decided this whole video kind of took a turn I decided to show you all a couple of the mistakes that I've made in my garden this year that I've really learned from. It's been a huge learning curve for me in this garden and I wanted to show you all um, just a couple things so hopefully you can take what I've learned and take it into your own garden. Now the very first one is right above the July blooming garden that I just planted the other day and that is this black walnut tree. Now a black walnut tree has a, uh, a chemical that it secretes called juggalone. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it true truly causes damage to a lot of plants that are growing underneath it and I did not realize how much damage it could cause until I noticed a lot of plants suffering underneath it and I have learned that you have to be specific about the type of plants that you can plant whether it be coneflower begonia ornamental grasses one of the things I did learn is that Peonies are a big no-no to plant underneath a black walnut, but I had no idea. I might have read that in a book somewhere in some, you know, point in my gardening career, but it didn't actually set in until I planted this peony underneath this black walnut and started noticing how much it was suffering. You can see all the begonia around it are thriving, but this poor peony is not happy. And that is absolutely a learning experience that I will take with me into next season. Another lesson I have learned in my garden this season is about this poor, poor Jack Frost Brunnera. I absolutely love Brunnera. It is a beautiful, beautiful plant, but this plant needs moisture. Anytime this plant dries out, it browns up, it crisps up, and it basically dies. Now, again, this is another herbaceous perennial, uh, so it might come back from the roots next season, but man, this guy has been unhappy, and not just right here, but all over in my garden. So I've learned how dry this garden is, at least right now, and so planting something like a begonia that has more succulent type leaves is going to be so much better for me than planting something like a brunnera that needs constant moisture. So it doesn't mean I can't ever plant brunnera. It just means for right now, while my soil is not quite finished being amended yet, I need to stick with things that can handle dryness a little bit more like begonias. All right, then I think you've all learned this lesson from me already this year, and that is how important pruning is. Look at this sad, sad fig tree that I have here. Now I do have an excuse. I hurt my foot this past fall, so I wasn't able to get out here on a ladder and prune this fig tree, but I'm gonna be honest, I was nervous about pruning anyway. It's just one of those things in the garden that intimidates me, but now that I didn't prune this poor fig tree this past season, Season, I can see what damage not pruning has done to it. All of the fruit, all of the leaves are at the end of these branches and it is weighing down these branches and this poor thing looks like it's just hanging on for dear life. So this 
just gave me the confidence that this fall, this winter, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to prune the heck out of this fig tree. And I needed to see this to feel confident enough to prune it myself. Now, just as I've learned from the mistakes in my garden, I've learned from the successes in my garden as well. For example, this zigzag planter. It's something that I thought was going to be an absolute eyesore in my garden, and now it is just such a beautiful focal point and something that I love and I'm so proud of. So I think the purpose of this video is just to remind you all to stop and to listen, to go out and to touch your garden, touch your plants, and learn from what your garden is trying to tell you. I hope you all enjoyed this and I hope you all have a chance to get in your garden today.